celebrating the 40th anniversary of the UN Conventions and Contract for the International Sale of Goods. I am Jose Angel Estrada Faria, Principal Legal Officer of Ancetral, and I have uh, with us today a series of uh, world-renowned experts on commercial contracts, and particularly the CISG, who would be addressing various uh, points concerning the current application, but also future perspectives of the CISG. All our speakers have already joined us, so we will be introducing all of them already now, and then giving them the floor as their turn comes up. The first uh, speaker on our list is Professor Ingeborg Schwenzer. Professor Schwenzer is Dean of Swiss International Law School and Professor Emerita of Private Law at the University of Basel, Switzerland. She's also an adjunct professor at Bonn University, Gold Coast in Australia. She's been an adjunct professor at City University in Hong Kong and at Griffith University in Brisbane. She has published extensively on contract law, private law generally, arbitration, and also family law. And she is currently the main contributor and, of the, and editor of the leading commentary on DCISG, uh, the uh, Schlechting Schwenzer commentary on the UN Convention of the International Sale of Goods, which is in its fourth edition and has been already translated in various languages, German, Spanish, Portuguese, and Turkish. She uh, has also been the chair of the CISG Advisory Council, active in many years of legal practice, uh, and an, uh, a well, uh, an, an international arbitrator in uh, big demand internationally. So she would be our first speaker, and uh, she, her topic would be the CISG at 40 quo vadis, and she would be addressing issues concerning the future application, future development of the CISG. Our second speaker joining us from Moscow is Professor Alexander Komarov. Uh, who has been the head of private international law department at Russian Academy of Foreign Trade in Moscow. From 1993 to 2010, he had been the president of the International Commercial Arbitration Court at the Chamber of Commerce and Industry of the Russian Federation. Uh, he is a member of the Council of Legal Reform and Codification of Civil Law at the President of the Russian Federation. He is a member of the Scientific and Consultative Council at the Supreme Court of the Russian Federation. He has been a member of the Unit Ra Governing Council and a delegate of the uh, Russian Federation in many international negotiations at Ancetro. Uh, Alexander Komarov would be addressing the topic, the impact of the CISG on the development of Russian contract law and the application of the CISG in Russia. Our third speaker is uh, Professor Shi Jingcha. She is a dean uh, at uh, an international business economic law professor at Ramin University in China uh, since 2020. She was previously dean at the University of uh, International Business Economic Law in uh, Beijing, China, where she joined the, the law faculty in 1998. She earned her PhD from Wuhan University. She has a degree and an a, a, a LLM from Yale Law School. She's a member of the New York Bar. She's been a member of boards of various corporations. She also is an international arbitrator and also a member of the uh, Governing Council of uh, UNIDRA. Professor Shi would be addressing the impact of the CISG on the development of contract law in the Chinese uh, civil code. Our third speaker joining us from Madrid is Professor uh, Pilar Perales Vizcasillas. Professor P uh, Perales is the chair of commercial law at the Carlos III University in Madrid since 2011. She's been a member of the board of directors as independent director of MAFRE uh, Sociedad Anonima. She's a co-editor of the uh, book on the CISG with uh, Stefan Kröll uh, and Mistelis. And she's also uh, a member of the CISG Advisory Council. She has participated in the drafting of the uh, third edition of the UNIDRA uh, Principles of International Commercial Contracts. She's been a correspondent of UNCITRA for, for, uh, for Cloud, and she's been a Spanish delegate to many negotiations at uh, UNCITRA as well. And last but not least, uh, and sorry, and Professor uh, uh, Pilar would, uh, uh, Perales Vizcasillas would address the topic of the extended scope of application of the CISG.
And last but not least, to be uh, being joined from Rome by Professor Anna Veneziano. Uh, Anna Veneziano is the Deputy Secretary General of uh, UNIDRA. She's a professor of comparative law at the University of Teramo in Italy, where she was formerly the director of the Department of Private Law. She was also a professor of European property law at the University of Amsterdam. Her education includes a law degree from, uh, from Rome and also an LLM degree from Yale Law School. She has participated in many uh, projects for uh, the harmonization of private law in Europe uh, and also for, uh, in particular, in the era of uh, secure transactions. And she will be addressing the topic of the influence of the contribution of the CISG to the development of international uh, contract law. And uh, the last speaker will be myself. And uh, I, on the basis of uh, the uh, speeches that have preceded me, uh, all of them certainly of a much higher quality than I could possibly deliver myself, I would uh, address the CISG as a backbone of uh, contemporary transnational commercial law. So now, without further ado, I'll give then the floor to uh, Professor Schwenzer. So Ingeborg, the floor is yours, please. Thank you so much, Angelo, for this very kind introduction. Good afternoon to everybody from Europe. Good morning to all participants from the Americas and good evening uh, to our participants in Asia and the Pacific. Uh, I'm very sad that I cannot be in Vienna in person today. I haven't been in Vienna for almost one year, uh, but still I'm happy that at least um, I can be, can be with you via this video lecture. Uh, I'll shortly give you an overview of what I'm going to talk about after a very short introduction. I will address the question of growing the CISG family. Then I will discuss uh, the possibility of preventing opting out from the CISG. Uh, securing uniform application and interpretation. And my fourth topic will be cultivating the borderland. And I will address issues I think that we have to face during the years to come before I then turn to a conclusion. A very brief introduction. I don't have to, to tell you about the history of the CISG. We are here uh, to celebrate the 40th birthday of the CISG. The CISG ended into, for, uh, into force on the 1st of January 1988, by the way, with uh, the, the United States and China joining forces and um, both deciding to join the CISG, thus fulfilling the prerequisites of 10 states uh, having joined the CISG so that the CISG could enter into force. I doubt whether this would be possible today again. Today, the CISG has 94 member states um, I will address this as my first point. Uh, where are the member states? How can we grow the number of member states of the CISG? Uh, the CISG is today, if you look at the WTO figures, potentially covering more than 80% of world trade. Why do I say potentially? Because all of you know the CISG is firmly based like arbitration on party autonomy. That means it is up to the parties uh, to opt out from the CISG, which unfortunately is quite often done. And that will be my second point uh, to discuss. And then um, I will turn to pending problems. The legal community is quite divided as regards um, the success of the CISG. There are still many concerns in many parts of the world, uh, concerns that relate to interpretation, to the uniformity of application and interpretation of the CISG. I will address these concerns. And finally, as regards 
the areas covered or better not covered by the CISG or in the borderland between the CISG and the otherwise applicable domestic law. So, so this will be my fourth point uh, to address. My first point is growing the CISG family. The CISG as of today has 94 member states. Just to remind you, the United Nations itself has 193 member states. Thus, we are almost approaching um, the, the number that half of all United Nations member states are also CISG member states. If we look to the different regions of the world, we see in the European Union, after Portugal having recently joined the CISG, uh, there are only missing Ireland and Malta. While Great Britain, no longer a member of the Un uh, European Union, uh, is no member of the, of the CISG. And I am afraid there is little hope that at least during the years to come after Brexit, Brexit that Great Britain will join the CISG. If we look to the Americas, there are only minor lacunae, the, the big country, countries, especially the, the big trading nations in the Americas are all members of the CISG. There are some states missing like Venezuela, Bolivia, and uh, some states in, the, in, the cent in Central America. But the bigger states, they are all and have been for a long time member states of the CISG. This is very different in Africa. Africa um, is mostly terra incognita for the, for the CISG, except for, for some countries in Africa, especially Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, the African states are not member states. Unfortunately, this also applies to South Africa, where discussions have been uh, for a long time that South Africa joins the CISG, but up to now, it's not a member state. In the Middle East, we are still missing mostly, I just mentioned the, the bigger countries, Iran, as well as Saudi Arabia. Uh, I talked to colleagues in Saudi Arabia, uh, contract law specialists, and they, they still are afraid that in some parts, the CISG is not compatible with the uh, Sharia, although I think if we want to, to make it compatible, then we could do it. It's, it's only minor, minor questions. And the main question, the, the interest question, we can easily solve um, by interpreting Article 78 in the right way. If we look to Asia and the Pacific, we do have some very important states missing, especially in India that never joined the CISG, but also Indonesia and Malaysia, where again, we do have concerns regarding the Sharia. Hong Kong, well, we don't know whether Hong Kong is a member state or not. We, we do have diverse case law on this question because it is unclear when, when Hong Kong uh, joined um, mainland China again, then it was um, unclear whether the, the CISG would extend to Hong Kong and Macau. Um, now there is, a, there, uh, there is a process in Hong Kong itself um, where they want to clarify the, that Hong Kong indeed is a member state of the, of the CISG. There, there has been investigations about that. And I hope that next year or maybe a bit later, it will be clear that Hong Kong too is a member of the CISG. Well, what can we do? What incentives do we have to grow the CISG family? Well, I think Ancitral and people at Ancitral 
uh, like Angelo, are really doing a great job in, in getting more and more states on board of the CRSG family ship. Um, I think a good incentive is always to tell the, the, the states, especially developing and transitioning countries, that the parties from their countries are so much better off in negotiating contracts if they are member states of the CISG, because they can always say, well, I, I know that you will never agree to my own law, like I would say Indian law, but we do have the CISG in common. So let's rely on the CISG and this benefits their bargaining position. My next point is about opting out from the CISG. You all know, uh, I already mentioned it, CISG based on party autonomy, according to Article 6 of the CISG, the parties may exclude the application of the CISG altogether. If we look at the status quo, there are, there are quite a few surveys, field research, uh, researching how often parties opt out from the CISG. And more or less these surveys come to the conclusion that in about 40 to 60% of cases where the CISG um, would be applicable, parties choose to opt out from the CISG. Uh, who opts out? Where do the parties come from? Well, these surveys have been conducted mostly in the United States and in, in Germany. Uh, they show that it is mostly US and German parties. Um, I, last year, I had a guest professorship in Japan and I talked to um, to in-house counsel from big Japanese companies. And I was told also in Japan, uh, many, many parties are opting out from the, from the CISG. So generally it is parties with stronger bargaining power, uh, those who are not able to choose or, or to insist on, on a certain choice of law, they will, they will not have the bargaining power to opt out from the CISG. But what are the reasons for opting out? Well, first of all, let's turn to the question of how are parties uh, choosing a choice of law clause in general? Well, there has been a very, very good um, research on it by Gustavo Moser, a Brazilian now working with LCIA. Um, it's called Rethinking Choice of Law. It has been published in 2018. And what Moser found out is that choice of law in essence is very irrational. So parties expect a lot, they have expectations from their choice of law, clear expectations as regards predictability uh, and so forth, but which law they choose in the end is very irrational because they have heard from somebody who had good experiences with that law or bad experiences with another law. So it's, it's not a sensible choice of law. And that does not only apply to general choice of law, it especially mostly applies to opting out from the CISG. So first of all, parties, if you talk to in-house lawyers or to, to lawyers uh, working with, uh, with companies, they will tell you, well, if I can, I, I will try to get my own law um, uh, governing the contract. So there's a very strong preference for one's own law, if that is possible, if you're if your client has the bargaining position. Uh, 
so what you learned and what you know, you prefer. You, you do not know the rest of possible laws that could apply, so you think your own law is the best just because you know it. And that goes hand in hand with uh, not being familiar uh, with the CISG. I think this is the main reason. Just to give you one example, I was involved in an arbitration concerning a, a big German and a big uh, US company, and they had a choice of law clause, and everybody will, will uh, know how stupid that is. They said, uh, this contract is governed by Swiss law to the exclusion of any ancestral and unidra laws. So the only thing they had ever heard is that there is an institution called ancestral and an institution called unidra, but I'm pretty sure they did never know what, uh, what kind of um, of laws or, or sets of rules like UNIDRA principles, which is not a law, everybody knows that uh, these institutions had passed. So they just excluded everything international um, because they did not know anything about it. And actually in the end, the American party lost the case because they had chosen domestic Swiss law. It would have succeeded under the CISG because domestic Swiss law is still based on a fault principle, whereas under the CISG, we do have strict liability. So the American party would have uh, come better out under the CISG than with domestic Swiss law. So let's, let's keep it that way. The main reason I think for opting out from the CISG is that neither council, uh, in-house council nor council are familiar with the CISG and thus they just exclude it. So how can we prevent opting out? So I think the first, the first approach is education. Yeah, we have to educate our students at the university. And I have taught at universities around the world on all five continents. And what I always encounter is that the CISG has not yet arrived in classes on domestic contract law. So the, the students, let's say in the United States for weeks, they, they study the prerequisites of consideration in contract law, but they never hear anything about the CISG. And likewise, I just had a guest professorship last week at Sorbonne in, in Paris with many French students who hadn't heard anything about the CISG in their contract classes. So this must be our first approach, educate the students, bring the CISG in the contract classes and compare it with the domestic contract law that the students have to learn. Very important is the Wismut and the, the Wismut community is growing every year, has thousands of, of former Wismutis around the world who are now partners in the, in the big leading law firms of the world. However, this is still a very small group. So uh, it's not enough uh, to prevent opting out. What has proven very efficient is having uh, the, the CISG as a mandatory uh, area in the bar exam. I did that in Switzerland and it was very, very, uh, very soon, very clear that the students for the bar exam prepared for the CISG 
and thus became familiar with the CISG and later uh, really considered it and did not exclude it just because they didn't know it. We also have to go to in-house counsel and we have to address them in workshops, in, in seminars. I did that in Japan with uh, a few Japanese companies, also leading companies of the, of the world and um, in-house in -house counsel did not know uh, at least not much about the CISG. They agreed even to US law or to New York law because many of their in-house counsel had studied um, in New York. And they thought, okay, we studied in New York, New York, so we know New York law, which is just not true, actually. And, and they agreed to New York law and excluded the CISG in the, uh, instead because they didn't know it. So we should make, when we, when we are educating not only students, but practitioners, we should tell them what are the consequences of opting out from the CISG. And those consequences are very, very severe. If a company is able to impose its own law on the other party, this is not yet the end of the story because the, this choice of law may not be recognized by the courts of the, uh, in, in the, the other party's country. This is, for example, true for Brazil. So if you have a, uh, an American and a Brazilian party and the American party has a very strong negotiation position and imposes a choice of law clause on the Brazilian party for in favor of New York law. And even if it is coupled with a choice of forum clause, let's say New York courts. Well, if a dispute arises, the Brazilian party is free to go to its own courts. Why? Well, first of all, the choice of forum clause will not be recognized by Brazilian courts. We are only starting on the international level uh, to give choice of forum clauses um, a, a, bit, a bit more of importance of recognition. We have that in arbitration with the, uh, with the New York Convention, but we don't have it yet uh, as regards choice of forum clauses. So first, the Brazilian court will not recognize the choice of forum clause. It will assume jurisdiction, despite the choice of forum clause leading um, to New York courts. And then when it comes to the applicable law, it, it will disregard the choice of law clause. It will instead apply its own law Brazilian law or maybe also the CISG because both parties have their place of business, Brazil and United States in CISG member states. So even if we have a party who has the negotiation power to impose its own law on the other side, that's not the end of the story. It might be defeated in the courts of the other party's country. Well, in many cases, especially um, if the parties are dealing at arm's length with one another, another, they don't choose the law of one of the parties, they choose the law of a third country. And among the laws chosen, the, the second mostly chosen law is Swiss law. Swiss law is regarded, or Switzerland is regarded as being neutral, and that is why many people choose Swiss law. So, but the parties who choose Swiss law to the exclusion of the CISG are maybe not aware of the consequences. First of all, so let's take a case, a Chinese and a Brazilian party are choosing Swiss law. They often did that, by the way, before Brazil became uh, a member state of the CISG. So what are the consequences? 
The first one is the language problem. Uh, in Switzerland, we do have three languages, but most of the legal texts are published in German, about 20% in, in French, uh, almost none in Italian. So we, uh, for parties from China and Brazil, this means they have to research a case in a foreign language, a foreign law and a foreign language. Texts, case law, scholarly writing, all must be translated to the language either of the arbitration or the language, if we have a, a litigation in court, then to the language of the court. You need legal experts. You need Swiss counsel for the case if you are choosing Swiss law. Then you need legal experts on Swiss law. And more often than not, the outcome of a case depends on whose expert is better on cross-examination than the other one. So the outcome is, especially if you choose Swiss law, the outcome is very often unpredictable. Why is that so? Well, Switzerland is a very small country with 8.5 million inhabitants. You can imagine central questions of contract law have never been decided by the Swiss Supreme Court or decisions are already 50, 80 years old. So you have a lot of scholarly writing pointing in all direction. You can, uh, you can advocate any possible result and you can rely on any scholarly writing in Switzerland if you don't have, for example, uh, a highest court decision. And finally, uh, Swiss law is firmly rooted in the 19th century. The actual text of the contract law, the code of obligations, dates back to 1912. And it has not been amended as many other as many other civil codes, like for example, Germany or, or France or, or the like. So we still have the text of 1912. And that might be suited for domestic cases, but it's certainly not suited for international business transactions nowadays. So what we should do is also um, tell or educate students, counsel about consequences of opting out from the CISG. Not only tell them, well, the CISG might be better suited than uh, German law or Swiss law, but what are the consequences if you are opting out? And well, we we only we only have anecdotal evidence that more and more we are hearing of malpractice claims because counsel, uh, without ever researching, um, excluded the CISG. So we we heard about cases in Germany, Australia, in the United States. Actually, it never. It, they never made it to, to a decision of a court. I think insurance companies are very much aware of this problem, of the problem they are facing, and insurance companies are very ready to settle such malpractice claims. So, my next point, uh, I see I have... Uh, already used about 30 minutes and we, we should go according to our, our timetable, we should already move to Q&A. So I will very briefly touch upon securing uniform application and interpretation. Probably many of you have heard about the so-called homeward trend that there are especially common law countries that seem to be prone to the homeward trend, uh, US courts, but also Australian and New Zealand courts. 
but at a closer look, even countries where you have a lot of case law on the CISG, like especially Germany, is not, uh, is also following the homeward trend, actually. If you look into a decision by the, by the German uh, Supreme Court, you will see that the German Supreme Court only cites German uh, decisions, sometimes a decision from Switzerland or Austria also in German, but mostly uh, the Supreme Court cites its own decisions or lower courts decisions and scholarly writing in German. I have hardly ever seen, I, I don't remember one, one single decision where the German Supreme Court cited uh, English, English scholarly writing, let alone uh, the scholarly writing of Professor Pilar Perales uh, in, in Spanish or the like, or French. Uh, so what does the homeward trend lead to? Well, it first leads to not applying the CISG. This is especially true for courts in Australia and New Zealand. We, to the very day, although both Australia and New Zealand have been uh, member states of the CISG for a very long time, uh, since the 1990s, I think, uh, we only have few cases in these countries. However, if we look to arbitral awards rendered by CTAC, we see there we have many cases involving Australian and New Zealand parties where the CISG was applied. So the fact that we have only little case law in New Zealand and in Australia uh, comes um, from that parties don't invoke the CISG, council don't know that the CISG applies, and judges don't know that the CISG applies. So nobody, sometimes often up to the Supreme Court um, of a, of a uh, state of Australia, of a, of a uh, yeah, territory or the like of Australia, uh, where where one one council suddenly recognizes that the CISG applies, but usually just all people involved don't know about the CISG. Well, the second consequence of the homeward trend is an interpretation of the CISG in light of domestic law. We can find that especially in the United States, where until some years ago, uh, there, were, there were district courts, especially the, the, the court of the Southern District of New York, uh, that said, well, uh, this provision of the CISG just looks like the provision of the Uniform Commercial Code, so we will rely on case law interpreting this provision of the Uniform Commercial Code to interpret the CISG as well, which is, as you all know, uh, not, not possible and should not be done because it clearly undermines uniform application and interpretation. Well, the reasons for the homework trend again are lack of knowledge. So many, uh, many uh, counsel, many judges just don't know the, the CISG. Um, a couple of years ago, I was invited uh, to the Supreme Court uh, of a CISG member state. And I gave a, pre I, don't, I don't mention which country it was. And we had the, the whole bench of Supreme Court judges there. And I gave um, a presentation on the CISG. And in our Q&A session, I was asked um, by a Supreme Court judge, but why should we apply the CISG with relation, it was a common law country, with relation to this other common law country, we both have the 
common law. Why should we apply the CISG? So that was a Supreme Court judge of one of the countries where we only have few case law on the CISG. Second point, so lack of knowledge is always decisive wherever you go with counsel or judges or students. So the second point for judges is language barriers. Well, this does not apply uh, to judges from common law countries because most of the of the case law today is translated into English and most of the scholarly writing, I would say nowadays 80% of the scholarly writing on the CISG is in English. So language barriers apply uh, to all other countries where, where English is not the native language. And you will find, especially as regards judges, uh, that the judges do, are not fluent in English. That not, does not only apply to a judge in, maybe even a judge in Vietnam is better in English than a judge in Germany or in Brazil or in Italy or in France. So they have the language barrier. They, they just cannot access um, the legal materials on the CISG that are in, in English. And usually they are just relying, uh, they don't have libraries anymore actually. Libraries are too expensive. They, they just access their domestic databases they have that are provided by publishing companies, publishing houses, and that are that are rented by, by uh, courts. And it depends what's in these databases. And there you, you have in Germany, you have only German material. You don't have English commentaries in a German database. So that is why uh, judges will only rely on their, on their country's uh, publications. And finally, judges, nowadays don't know much about international trade anymore because the relevant cases, more than I would say 60% of the cases and among the high caliber cases, they are all arbitrated. I once just looked at, I, I ran CISG online, the database on the CISG and randomly I looked at the last 100 entries and they are all judge, um, court decisions. And I found that among the last, the most recent 100 decisions, there was only one case having an amount in controversy that was 1 million euros. So for arbitration, I would say this is just peanuts. In arbitration, we have cases of 100 million uh, euros, uh, dollars, or even billions, yes? And all these cases are arbitrated. They don't go to domestic cause, courts. I once asked the chair of the, of the sales senate of the German uh, Supreme Court, uh, how he gets his examples for developing uh, case law on uh, developing the CISG. And he told me, well, you know, what comes to the German Supreme Court is mostly like the Italian manufacturer of shoes selling non-conforming shoes to a German retailer. Well, I think it's hard to develop uh, the law of sales for international international uh, cases like um, uh, a, a power plant or, or the like uh, on, on cases like this. So I have securing uniform 
uh, application and interpretation, well, I'll just move to the possible tools to secure uniformity. Ancitral is doing a great job. Again, we do have the Ancitral Digest already in its second edition, and we have Cloud, the case law on Ancitral texts. The Ancitral Digest, Ancitral is not in a position actually uh, to criticize the, the courts of member states. An Ancitral has to stay neutral as a United Nations uh, institution, neutral towards its member states and cannot criticize. Uh, even it can only show that we have divergent case law on certain questions, but it cannot tell uh, state courts which way to go. And against this background, the CISG Advisory Council was founded a group of, um, of professors from all over the world and many, many CISG countries and even non-CISG country like Great Britain. And we are um, publishing opinions on in areas where there has been divergent case law and that are very much disputed in, in scholarly writing. Up to now, we have published 20 opinions. The last one was on hardship and its consequences under the CISG. And these opinions, well, sure, they are not binding upon any state court. But these opinions are regularly cited as, um, as a persuasive authority and many Supreme Courts around the world and many, for example, uh, courts also in the United States have followed the opinions of the CISG Advisory Council. Thus, we, are, uh, we, we have uh, a very important tool to secure uniform application and interpretation. Databases that are freely accessible. Um, and I think one of the most important tools to secure uniform application and interpretation are commentaries. Um, if you have commentaries that are based on the same, uh, the same text, but then in different languages. For example, my own commentary uh, is in English with Oxford University Press, but the day when the CISG entered into force in Brazil, we, uh, we launched the Portuguese edition of this commentary. Thus, if now a case goes, an international case goes to the Brazilian courts, they may rely on the Portuguese version of a commentary, whereas let's say the American party can take the English commentary and they can discuss the same text. And there you have also, you have a comparative, the, the comparative approach that is so important and that a judge can never, can never uh, fulfill. Well, I have to ask our, our host, uh, I'm afraid my time is up and uh, should, I, should I come to cultivating the borderland? Ingeborg, your time is never up, but you could slowly come to your conclusion so, so we have some time for questions. Okay, so uh, maybe uh, can you make available my slides to the to the audience so that they may have a look at what I had in mind when discussing uh, cultivating the borderland. That would be that would be very nice. And let me come to my conclusion. Despite Cassandra, I think the CISG is truly a story of worldwide success. It is slowly but steadily growing. And I think the, the legal community has a growing trust into the CISG. We have to distinguish, I think it is hard uh, for state courts to apply the CISG 
due to the lack of education and the lack of, uh, of language knowledge of the judges. This is much easier in arbitration where where we uh, the language of arbitration is English, so all the material is accessible in English, and it is knowledgeable counsel who will who will if the CIC applies in arbitration, knowledgeable counsel who will research uh, the CIC on a comparative basis and use everything every decision they can find from any CISG member state to back up their client's position. Um, I think the, the global CISG community, especially the, the VIS Mutis can promote uniformity and um, develop its application. And what I had to leave out, but what I hope that you will have a look, look at in the borderland that I wanted to discuss between the CISG and domestic law, I think you can see the CISG with its vague and open terms has been open to embrace new developments, not only uh, technical developments like e-commerce and the like, but also legal developments. And with this, thank you. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Ingeborg, and Ms. Batuga for having agreed to join us. We have five minutes for discussion. I don't know where we're in the audience we have. You want to like to ask questions? Is the, yes. The... Um, I have the impression that uh, CISG is uh, more accepted by funds Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I yes, I'll, I'll repeat. I'll repeat the questions to okay. you, Ingeborg. Don't worry. Thank you. We see the law jurisdictions uh, because we can see that many countries that have common law uh, system um, have uh, had an uh, assigned certified uh, the convention. Um, is it uh, is it true that maybe for common law system this convention is not very uh, let's say convenient for say a legal system. So the question was, could you confirm that uh, there is a, the CISG is more easily acceptable to civil law jurisdictions rather than common law jurisdictions? And what, in your views, would be the reasons for this reluctance of common law to embrace the CISG? Of course, when you say common law not embracing the CISG, you should forget the United States and Australia that both and Canada, that all three of them have ratified the CISG. Perhaps you focus on uh, the renitent ones, uh, Ingeborg. Thank you. Yes, uh, thank you very much. Well, um, as regards opting out, I'm afraid there are, there are many civil law, uh, counsel from many civil law jurisdictions who are opting out due to unfamiliarity with the CISG. And if you talk to, to German lawyers, they think the CISG um, is too buyer friendly. And if you have a German seller, then they would, they would advocate opting out from the, from the CISG. I think maybe um, in civil law countries, there is a bit more of familiarity with the CISG. Uh, I don't think that uh, common law lawyers by themselves are more skeptical about uh, the CISG than civil law lawyers. And I was a um, couple of years ago, um, I spent two months or so in Australia and gave a lot of lectures there. And there, there was a, a growing awareness, uh, especially among barristers about the CISG and um, the fact that they might, might face malpractice claims if they, if they just opt out. So I think, I think there's not much dif difference really. Maybe, you know, the Americans, 
they they are louder than than the rest of the world in voicing their skepticism against the CISG. And there are some people uh, who are very loud in the uh, in the United States who say, well, but you see, if you look at them, uh, there was one once I was part of a of a blog where uh, U.S. American colleagues discussed. Uh, the benefits of the Uniform Commercial Code um, in comparison to the CISG. But that implies that you are able to have the UCC govern your contract. And as I said, even if you have a choice of law for the UCC or for New York law, which would be the U UCC, uh, then you, you can still not be sure whether a foreign court will recognize this clause. So I don't, I don't think in the end, and I, I have many, I know many people now from Australia uh, and also from New Zealand who nowadays um, really know about the CISG and uh, really back, back up the, the CISG and advance it in, in the discussions. Thank you, Gabor. We have one more quick question. So the question was, how likely do you think it would be to persuade the United Kingdom, a country whose sales law is, uh, at least according to the person asking the question, one that favors the buyer and whose shipping laws, and that is universal knowledge, is very favorable to the ship owners, how a, such a country could be persuaded to join the uh, CISG and how likely do you think that could be? Uh I think the reasons why, why Great Britain uh, never joined the CISG and it would be hard to be persuaded is not a reason for the, for the content of the CISG uh, with the comparison to the content of, of English law. Uh, I mean, in fact, the, the CISG is truly a, a very good compromise, I think between common law and civil law. And it has adopted a lot of common law solutions. So I think the content is not really decisive. It is other, other questions, probably the, uh, well, the, the bar, uh, the English bar and the, uh, the, the lawyers in the city of London that prevent uh, the CISG from being adopted. Actually, there was years ago, I think it's all, almost 20 years ago, um, the, the Law Commission recommended to join the CISG for Great Britain, but it was practice who was against it. Thank you very much, Ingeborg. I'm mindful of the time, for, especially for those the speakers who are joining us from different time zones, who are uh, still up, up late to uh, join us. Um, but just before moving to Alexander, simply add one anecdote to the point you made about ignorance of the CISG, Ingeborg. I was recently at an event on art and law, and one of the points discussed was the law applicable to the sale of object, objects of art. And uh, one uh, lawyer was pointing out that the auction houses in, in Austria and also in Germany systematically exclude the CISG. And I had to point out to them, well, they just really need to read the CISG. It doesn't apply to auctions anyway. But you see it's an example of 
this, this automatic exclusion. But then as you talk about the substance, people realize that uh, Austrian law applies the principle of gross disparity. And there's probably no area where we have a bigger risk of something being sold for 15 times what it's worth than in the art market. And then probably uh, the sellers in the art market would, would, would be much better off with a more balanced system like the CISG, where there is no uh, lesser norms or gross disparity. So that just so to underscore the point you've just made about ignorance when uh, excluding the CISG. But perhaps you can come back to that at the final discussion. Now I would like not to abuse of the patience of those who are joining us from, from afar and uh, give the floor immediately. Again, thank you, Ingeborg for your, uh, uh, your lecture. And I'll give the floor now to Alexander Komarov for his comments. Alexander, please. Dear colleagues, I would like to say a few words about the impact of CSG on the development of Russian contract law. The shift from state planning to market economy in the Russian Federation in the early 1990s created an urgent need for a new civil law, which could provide a stable foundation supporting emerging elements of a new economic system, such as private property, business organizations, contracts, and other areas of commercial law. The legislative frame for doing business at that time in the Russian Federation was quite volatile and subject to frequent and sometimes erratic changes. Having all this in mind, the Russian government initiated a modernization of national civil code. The reform of Russian civil law had as a main goal to establish adequate legal framework and to ensure by this means the development of market relations in domestic economic life. CISG came into force in the Russian Federation at the beginning of 1992 and was supposed to apply to foreign trade transactions. At the same time, the contents of the Convention was looked at as a source for inspiration to work out a new legal mechanism. Uh, which could substitute the previous system of centralized national economy by way of introducing more trade-friendly and modern regulation of domestic business relations. This was especially important for emerging small and middle private enterprises, which had little experience, if any, in private dealing and could not afford to spend much money on legal fees nor have contracts drafted in much detail. Also, transparent regulation could have contributed largely to reduce transaction costs. From the very beginning, in the process of the drafting of the new Russian civil code, great attention had been paid to current developments of civil law in major foreign legal systems and to international instruments adopted under the auspices of international organizations which were involved in the unification of international trade law. In fact, it resulted that the new Russian Civil Code had included quite a considerable number of rules which had been formulated, taking into account actual trends and tendencies found in the practice of modern business law, especially in those countries that represent different legal traditions. The source which had been mostly often referred to in the process of drafting of the rules relating to co contract law was the text of CISG. It had been considered by the drafters of the Civil Code as the most authoritative legal text in this area, since it was the result achieved in, on international level and represented well-balanced regulation of relations between the seller and the buyer. Also, it should be mentioned that the great role in this work had played the fact that both Russian civil law and CISG shared basic legal concepts, and they were also very close on several specific issues. Another positive factor which obviously facilitated this work was that one of the official texts 
of the Convention was Russian. The adoption of the new civil code in Russia had manifested the transition of national legal system to private law principles and regulation of economic activities. It meant the abandonment of legal regulation based on centralized and planned system and creation of legal framework for development of market relationship in national economy. As a result of this work, some norms of the Russian Civil Code were formulated, if not literally in accordance with the CSG, but at least along the lines of corresponding rules of the Convention. It is also an evidence that current Russian civil law had been modernized along the lines of internationally recognized standards. It would be interesting to mention that in the post-Soviet time the text of CSG had been used also in drafting corresponding parts of model civil code of the Commonwealth of independent states and the national civil codes of some post-Soviet states. Legal rules that were formulated under the influence of corresponding norms of CAG are mostly placed in the chapter on the purchase and sale of the Russian Civil Code. But some rules formulated under the influence of CSG were also included in the general part of contract law, due to the importance of these rules for the whole area of contract law. This could be illustrated by the norm of the Russian Civil Code concerning the formulation of the grounds for liability for the breach of the contract. The Code introduces the principle of no-fault liability for the breach of the contract. And this rule says, if a person who has not performed an obligation or has performed an obligation in an improper manner in the conduct of business activity shall be a liability unless he proves that proper performance became impossible as the result of extraordinary circumstances unavoidable under the given conditions. Another example of this kind is the concept of fundamental breach which means that the contract may be rescinded in case of fundamental breach of it. The Russian Civil Code provides the legal consequences of fundamental breach and defines fundamental breach very close to the wording of Article 25 of CSG. As regards the delivery of the goods of improper quality, the Russian Civil Code gives the specific definition of fundamental breach. And this definition uh, says uh, discovery of defects that cannot be eliminated, defects that cannot be eliminated without inadequate expenses or expenditures of time, or defects that appear repeatedly or that appear again after their elimination and other such defects. Also, the CSG provision concerning the contract where the price is not provided, Article 55, had impact on the decision of the drafters to introduce the corresponding rule in the Russian Civil Code. This rule is included in the chapter which contains the definition and terms of the contract in general, and that means that this rule has to be applied to price de determination as regards all kinds of contracts and not only sale, sales contract. During the work on the new civil code, not only norms relate, re regulating specific aspects of the contract of the sale, but even the perception of sale of goods contract was based in principle on the understanding reflected in CISG. That is important to mention because in Russia, in previous times, the commercial sales contracts had been hardly used as a legal instrument in domestic economic turnover. The regulation of business activities lacked dispositive rules and corresponding trade customs and established practice necessary for stable commercial turnover. The new legal environment must have been amended for the new economic conditions by way of providing dispositive norms in the Civil Code. Many of such rules had been formulated in accordance with the corresponding norms of the CSG. For example, the Russian Civil Code formulates duties of the seller to transfer the goods in accordance with Article 33 CSG, providing 
for the seller's obligation to transfer the goods and documents relating to them. The rules of Russian Civil Code about the handling of the goods to the buyer are also based on the corresponding provisions of CSG. Also, the norms of the Civil Code which provide for the buyer's obligation to take delivery are based on the concept represented in the corresponding rules of CSG. It is worth to underline that, like CSG, the Russian Civil Code adopted the same approach providing for two-year period for notice on the non-conformity of the goods. Also, the treatment of third-party claims in the Russian Civil Code follows the approach adopted in CSG. It provides for the duty of the seller to transfer the goods free from the rights of third parties. Unlike in the past time, under new economic conditions in the Russian Federation, the recovery of damages had become a universal remedy in private business relationship in case of the breach of contract. The Article 76 of CSG providing for calculation of damages in case of rescission of the contract played the important role in formulating the corresponding rules in the Civil Code. Also, it should be mentioned that it was a radical step in developing Russian business law, because before this time, this kind of remedy for the breach of the contract was hardly used in practice of economic relations, because there was no necessary regulation and court practice concerning calculation of damages for the breach of the contract and market relationship. As regards application of CSG in Russia, the practice of the arbitration institution which had been dealing with the great majority of international commercial disputes in Russia, that is, International Commercial Arbitration Court and the Russian Federation Chamber of Commerce and Industry, shows that more than half of the all cases relating to international sale of goods were solved applying CSG. The summaries of the considerable number of, C, uh, of uh, awards rendered by ICAC and the court decisions where CSG was referred to are to be found in the following databases Cloud, Central, and Unilex and Drua. It's necessary to mention that in the last years, state courts in Russian Federation, which have dealt with commercial disputes, started to refer to CISG in deciding disputes more than often, uh, more often than before. All illustration of the arbitration practice relating to application of CISG may serve their words connected with application of Article 79 of CSG, providing for exemption from liability for failure to perform con contractual obligations in cases where the party referred to this provision. The distinctive feature of this practice is that the arbitral tribunals practically never recognize the change of circumstances of economic character as the impediment beyond control of the party that it could not reasonably be expected to have taken into account at the time of the conclusion of the contract or to have avoided or overcome it or its consequences. The negative attitude to application of the exemption from liability for the breach of the contract, the arbitral tribunals showed when the party revoked Article 79 insisting that it could not performed the contract due to legal impediments, like failure to get export or import license, embargo, etc. In cases concerning the liability for the breach of contract, the arbitral tribunals often had to apply Article 80 of CSG, which was revoked by one of the parties. The attention of the tribunal was, in such cases, focused on finding out if the failure of the party to perform the contract was caused by the other parties' acts or omissions. Thank you for your attention. Chen Chia, can you join us now? Uh, sure. Excellent. Yes. Thank you very much. We, and we can hear okay. loud and clear. Please go ahead. 
So that is no problem to hear me, right? No, we are hearing you very well. Thank you. Okay. Um, thank you so much, Angelo, for uh, your invitation and your kind introduction to me. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning, uh, good afternoon, or good evening, wherever you are based now. I'm tremendously uh, honored to participate in this very exciting CISD 40th anniversary lecture series, uh, even by video conference. I echo the topic of this series that the CISG has truly uh, served as the backbone for transnational commercial law. To demonstrate this, uh, I'm happy to share with you about the impact of CISG on the uh, Chinese contract law, newly codified into the Chinese civil code. Uh, so in my speech, I will briefly uh, touch upon three aspects. The first, uh, a very brief general background on the uh, civil code and its part on a uh, contract. Second, how the CISG generates impact on this code, uh, and as well as you know, uh, on the evolution of Chinese contract law. And thirdly, uh, I summarize uh, the way of China's utilization of the CISG. So first regarding, uh, uh, first I, I'd like to give you a very brief introduction of China's new civil code and its part on contract. Um, the civil code was enacted by the National People's uh, Congress, uh, Congress of China on May 28th uh, this year to be entered into force on January 1st, uh, 2021 next year. Uh, a codification of private laws that regulate uh, property and personal rights, the civil code is China's first statute styled as a code. So it also means when the civil code becomes effective next year, the previous standalone statutes, including contract law, will be uh, simultaneously replaced and re or repealed. The code is a massive piece of legislation, including uh, 1,020 uh, 260 articles divided into seven parts. That is the general part, part on rights in RAM, part on contracts, part on personality rights, part on marriage and the family, part on inheritance, and finally, uh, part on tort liability. The part on contracts is the longest uh, part among the code's seven parts. It has 29 chapters in total, which are divided into uh, three subparts, general provisions, typical contracts, and quasi contracts. Uh, in my second part of the speech, uh, I would like to address the impact of CISG on the contract law in China, including uh, from the perspective of legislation and also uh, practice as well. China, uh, as mentioned by uh, Professor Xuanza in, in her speech, China was the 10th uh, signatory state to the CISG and the convention became effective in, uh, in China on January 1st, 19, uh, 20, uh, 1988. So during the past over three decades, the CISG has had a phenomenal impact uh, in China, proof of which has twofold. First, the CISG has greatly uh, influenced the evolution of Chinese domestic contract law. During the drafting of the 1999 uh, contract law, the CISG was one of the most important uh, sources of uh, reference. The formation of a contract performance compensation for losses pursuant to the CISD are all identical with the provisions of domestic law. Hence, there is no uh, big conflict between an application of the CISD compared with uh, uh, Chinese domestic law on these issues. 
Furthermore, the drafters of the law at that time have um, uh, consulted and absor absorbed the rules of the CSG on offer and acceptance, avoidance, termination, uh, liabilities for breach of a contract, interpretation of a contract, and et cetera. So, uh, the CISG's impact on Chinese contract law are not only uh, limited to sales specific topics, it has uh, had an impact on non sales specific issues uh, as well. This particularly uh, reflected in uh, Chinese new uh, civil code, which cover uh, not only, you know, for the contract part, not only the sales contract. Uh, both uh, the Chinese uh, delegation attended uh, attended the 1980 Vienna Conference. China uh, did not have domestic legislation on the subject of a contract. Um, for the the country was at that time and a strictly uh, planned economy until the reform and uh, opening up policy implemented in China in 19. Uh, 78. However, to some extent, the rationales uh, learned by the Chinese delegation from the Vienna Conference triggered the uh, enactment of a Chinese domestic contract law and the special regulations for international trade as well. So a brief uh, overview of the history tells us that around the time of China's approval of the CSG, several sets of private law rules were promulgated. Uh, this includes uh, the 1981 economic contract law, the 1985 foreign related economic contract law, the 1986 general principle of civil law, and the 1987 technology uh, contract law. Then, as I mentioned just now, on October 1st, 1999, China took a further step towards the unification of domestic contract law by enacting uh, the uniform contract law. The first uh, um, uniform contract law in China and uh, which played an important role in China's economic development since then. The 1999 contract law uh, actually in, in China is held a big success because it not only unified the fragmentary uh, contract law uh, regime in China, but also substantially modernized uh, the contract regime as well. What an achievement this, this is may be illustrated by the fact that the contract law for the first time explicitly recognized you know, some basic, uh, basic principles of modern contract law, such as the principles of contractual freedom and good faith. Uh, this uh, is an uh, overview from uh, legislative history in China. Uh, second, you know, with Ch China's uh, active participation in international trade, not surprisingly, uh, the application of the CSG in practice in China has been engaging uh, increasing attention from Chinese courts, arbitration tribunals, uh, and a, a commentator, you, uh, uh, as well as the scholars. Uh, as we can see from the uh, cloud database um, on the uh, Ancestral website, it contains over 100 cases, including arbitration and litigation reported cases involving the application of uh, CSG uh, in, in, in China. But the, there are a lot of cases, you know, actually not reported in uh, by this website. In many reported cases, uh, I mean reported uh, cases, the outcome uh, already suggests that the CSG, had it been applied, would not have changed the result as well. So when it to uh, conclude for this part, when it comes to the impact of CSG on China's new civil code, 
my basic observation seems that during you know the pre process of making this civil code, the drafters may not directly borrow the provisions from the CSG since there are uh, relatively few discussions in this kind in China. However, you know, uh, several days ago, when I consult a very famous expert on contract law who is the main contributor to our civil law, uh, he, he told me that uh, uh, it is not, uh, not the case. And also, you know, to a large extent, the making of Chinese uh, civil code is a process of um, codifying many already existing statutes regulating private uh, property and rights with some only some new provisions reflecting new developments such as e-commerce and the Chinese uh, practice. So uh, if you consult the civil code, you will find out that the part on contract contains 526 articles and is mainly based on the 1999 contract law, which has already, you know, 428 articles. During the draft of 1999 contract law, as I emphasized uh, uh, before, the CSG was one of the most important sources of reference. So it is not hard to understand that the CSG generates a big impact on civil code as well. And just because of this is a contract, the part of contract in the civil code during the, during the process of making has not been uh, particularly controversial uh, since the set of the advanced rules are, are not supposed to be changed much. So the last part of my speech uh, is addressing, uh, you know, the issue, uh, so-called to transplant or not, China's way of utilizing uh, CSG. So from the, the above historical and the comparative analysis, it is clear that the CSG has generated a great impact on, uh, on the Chinese contract law. The development of Chinese contract law now uh, codified uh, into the civil code could not have been achieved if Chinese legislators had ignored the guiding value of the CSG. In this respect, there is a notion of uh, double transplantation it involves the adoption of the CSG as China's international sales law and China's subsequent use of the CSG as a major source in drafting its own sales contract law, even uh, some for some provisions broadly, you know, uh, to be used uh, uh, in uh, in contract part, contract law part, not only sales contract. That being said, it's uh, easy to understand that the civil code is indeed greatly affected by the CSG as well. Uh, however, despite the above interaction, I'd uh, also like to point out that China has not adopted the CSG in a wholesale way. Some provisions in uh, Chinese civil code still possess strong Chinese uh, characteristics. Some are still uh, uh, different from their counterparts in the CSG, in the convention. Uh, such unique provisions mainly focus on contracts subject to the approval or registration requirement by public authority uh, in China, uh, some spe specific types of contract subrogation and the contracts concluded under a state mandatory plan or state purchase order. Uh, this is mainly uh, newly reflect because of uh, in civil code because of the COVID-19. In the meantime, the impact of CSG on Chinese contract law should not only be reflected in the black light rules, but also should be at the practice and application uh, level as well. So to uh, give an example, also to address the interesting issue uh, mentioned by Professor Xuanza in her uh, wonderful speech regarding the uh, applicability of CSG to Hong Kong and Macau uh, special administrative region. 
the issue actually results from the declaration by China on the uh, Article 95 and Article uh, 96 of the CSG, which have uh, long been causing uh, confusion uh, in theory uh, and in practice as well. Later on, two purported Article 93 CRSG declaration made by China, respectively regarding Hong Kong and Macau have uh, led to remarkably divergent decisions on the uh, applicability of the CRSG to uh, Hong Kong and Macau, further add, adding to the current uncertainty in practice. But uh, it was argued, uh, and also my, uh, it is my view that there are a lot of good reasons to withdraw these uh, two declarations by China and Article 195 uh, and uh, 96 of the CSG. Among others, uh, withdrawal of the reservation will be limited uh, all the inconsistency and uncertainty thereby bring, uh, bringing uh, enforcement of the CSG into, into line with the Chinese current uh, policies and also uh, promoting uniform application of the CSG with its full acceptance in, in China. Um, furthermore, there are also compelling reasons to implement the CSG in Hong Kong and Macau um, in accordance with uh, China's longstanding commitment to honor its international treaty obligations, including the CSG. And also implementation is also uh, in the very interest of the of Hong Kong and Macau themselves and confirms to China's aspiration to maintain the prosperity and the stability of Hong Kong and Macau. In the long run, I think implementation of the CSG in, uh, in Hong Kong and Macau will also further the goals of the CSG to promote worldwide uniformity and enhance legal certainty in international trade. To conclude, I believe the modernization of Chinese contract law continue to be in the process of learning from successful international legislation and experience such as CSG, along with um, uh, the ongoing development of the market economy and China's more integration into the world economy through such initiative as the Belt and the Road Initiative, I believe that the CSG will be uh, even more widely accepted and uh, uh, greatly applied more often. The reach of CSG to Hong Kong and Macau will get uh, resolved as well. Thank you so much for, for your listening. Uh, I still I highly uh, appreciate the opportunity given by Ancestral uh, to me uh, regarding these wonderful events in celebration of the 40th anniversary of CRSG. Thank you. We'll we, we pass then to move on to Pilar. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for, for the invitation, Angelo, Thomas. It's a pleasure to be um, and an honor to be, um, you know, even though uh, through video conference in um, celebration of the 40th anniversary of the CIG and uh, also at the University of Vienna and also with uh, UNCITRAL. I have made a presentation, but um, I'm sure I would not be able to to put it because I'm now with uh, two um, with um, with the iPad and the computer and I don't think I can handle the two of them. But Thomas, I sent it to you so you can deliver it to the students if you if you want. Okay. So thank you very um, much. We'll share it with them. Thank you. Okay. okay. So um, what I'm going to speak today is about the extended application of the CIG, which is quite a broad topic. And it covers uh, or purport to, to cover many different aspects in relation with the material scope of application of the Vienna Convention. That is, um, I think this is an issue that we're uh, seeing uh, developments in case law uh, as well as scholarly writings in this area, interesting developments 
And I think it's going to be one of the topics for the future, uh, you know, application and interpretation of the CIG. As uh, you know, uh, the material scope of application of the CIG is uh, seen in articles two and three, mainly also four and five of the, of the convention. And uh, important also to notice is that uh, uh, in accordance with the CIG, it is relevant, the distinction uh, as you know, between the domestic distinction between a civil and a commercial uh, contract or the civil or commercial character of the of the parties. Um, if you see the structure of the CIG, it looks very familiar to to all of us um, because uh, it um, plainly it refers to the uh, contract of for the sale of goods, meaning uh, the typical contract of sales that we have known since Roman law, even before, and that we usually have in our um, commercial or civil codes in, in our countries. That's uh, the typical obligations of the parties is for the seller to deliver the goods or to hunt uh, the documents or transfer the property, plus the buyer has to pay the price and take delivery of the goods. And that is something that you see plainly in articles 30 and 53 of the CIG. Um, there are, however, two elements uh, uh, to consider in the discussion of the extended scope of application of the convention. One is the duration of the contract, and the other one is the obligations of the parties. In also um, important to bear in mind that although I'm talking about the traditional concept of the sale of goods that is seen in our codes and in our you know um, traditional laws. Um, there is an autonomous uh, concept for the sale of goods in accordance with the case law uh, of the CIG, meaning that we cannot derive from domestic courts the self-autonomous concept, the international concept for the sale of goods within the convention. This has been quite uh, very clearly established by scholars and by case law, and I cite here one interesting case from Italy, uh, Tribunal di Forli, from 6 March 2012. You have in the in the presentation you have the the abstract of the case, and that was uh, something very well established uh, over there. In terms of, I, I was saying it was important to consider the duration of the contracts because usually the 19th century codes, civil or commercial, when uh, deals with the international, with the sorry, with the sale of goods, the domestic ones, of course, they uh, refer to a very simple contract, one such contract. Therefore, uh, a straightforward um, situation where the uh, seller pays for the price and the buyer delivers the goods. But of course, those conceptions from the 19th century, which is pre-industrial, very much uh, attached to agricultural products, does nothing pass what is the modern reality of the international sale of goods transactions. And the fact, uh, the, the question here to consider is whether or not the CRG covers also more complex contracts not only in terms of duration, but also in terms of the obligations of the parties that can be much more broader than the simple delivery of the goods and the payment of the price. Uh, in this regard, um, it's, it's interesting to compare CIG here with the UNIDRA principles, because as you know, UNIDRA principles covers, generally speaking, international commercial contracts, therefore going further uh, broader uh, from the CIG uh, concept of, of, of the sale of goods. And also interesting is the latest edition of the UNIDRA principles of 2016 that, as you know, cover the long-term contracts, uh, meaning contracts in which the duration of the uh, obligations performed by the parties, and particularly does that are characteristic of the performance of the buyer under the sale of goods, consists on the delivery of, of the goods. Uh, in this way, if you compare the definition and, and not only the definition, but also the kind of contracts that are considered in that definition of long-term contracts, you will see, for example, that the um, supply agreements, which is clearly something that is covered by the CRG, are considered to be 
a type of long, long term contract. The same for distributorship agreements, the same for framework agreements, operation and maintenance agreements, construction civil works contract. And pointing out this specifically, um, I'm on the long list uh, that you will find in the comments of the Unitra principles, because I think those are the area in which we are seeing little by little the unextended scope of application of the convention. In order to derive the extended scope of application from the convention, it is important to analyze, to study, um, to consider article three of the uh, Vienna convention, because that's the provision that uh, usually um, gives you the framework in order to consider this extended um, scope of application of the, of the convention. Article three um, has two parts, article three one, uh, refers to contracts for the supply of goods, something that are considered a, a type of contract that I said before is considered because of their direct, duration as part of the long-term contract definition of the UNODRA principles, but however are covered by the CISG. So therefore we have the contracts for the supply of goods to be manufactured or produced, and those are considered to be sales of goods contracts. There is an exception though, and this goes uh, in the second part of the definition, but I'm not going into that um, at, this, uh, at this moment. What is important here to, to take into account is that the CIG considers itself that the sale of goods concept goes beyond the traditional concept of the sale of goods because contract not only for the delivery of already manufactured goods are considered within the scope of application, but also more importantly, contracts where uh, the goods have to be manufactured or produced. Therefore, um, where work or services um, on the things are provided by, um, by the buyer. That is something quite, quite different from the traditional concept in, what, in which only the delivery, there is the, there is the obligation to do something is considered as part of the main obligation of the buyer under the traditional uh, conception of the sale of goods. Then um, Article 3.2 considers the application um, of the CIG to mix contracts. Therefore, contracts in, in which there's not only the obligation to deliver the goods or to manufacture or produce the goods, as I, we've seen before, but also in um, whether also there are some services obligation together with that delivery obligation. Those mixed contracts are considered also to be CSG contracts insofar the preponderant part of the obligation that uh, the party who furnishes the, the goods con uh, does not consist in the supply of labor or other services. Therefore, if the services are not the main part of the obligations to be provided, then the contract is considered to be um, a contract for the sale of goods. This means that the CSG approach is a unitary approach towards the whole uh, package of obligation of the parties within the contract. And that is important because there is no need to separate the different obligations of the party in order to consider that one obligation refers to one kind of contract or type of contract and another obligations means um, that you are in a different type of contract. And therefore, with the potential uh, risk of excluding the application of the convention. None of this. The CSG considers that this unitary approach and therefore mixed contracts are also considered to be part of uh, the CSG concept, which as you see is a more um, evolutive um, concept as compared with the traditional definitions within our, our codes. Um, in, that regard, uh, Article 3 uh, was the subject of an opinion of the CIG Advisory Council that uh, Professor Svensson was referring to you before. And it is, uh, that is opinion number four, where you can find um, more details about the interpretation of, uh, of, article, of article 3. So then, um, if we take into account this extended um, definition of the sale of goods, then what we see in case law and as well in, in, in the scholarly writings is that there are um, contracts that are not within the domestic uh, classifications considered to be sale of goods contracts, 
but other kind of different countries that are, however, consider within the scope of application of the Vienna Convention. That happens with the contracts uh, for works and um, materials that are um, different in domestic uh, law systems, but that might be well considered within the scope of application of the Convention. The same happens um, in relation with distributorship agreements. In this sense, um, there is a tendency in case law to consider that the uh, distributor agreements, more exactly, the sale of goods uh, that are concluded within the framework of a distribution contract, those are considered also to be governed by the Vienna Convention. This is quite log logical because in this situation, those sale of goods concluded under a distribution, distributorship framework agreement are without no doubt sale of goods contract. More difficult is the idea of extending the scope of application of the convention to the framework agreement itself, therefore to the distributorship uh, agreement. In that regard, um, we find a different case law uh, with opposing uh, conclusions in, in terms of whether or not CRG can apply to the framework distributorship uh, agreements. Um, in this uh, in this regard, there is a tendency, to some uh, some tendency in case law to consider that CSG does not apply to the framework agreements, and this is because of two considerations, two different uh, considerations. One of them is the lack of essential elements, uh, meaning the lack of essential elements from the formation of the contract in Article 14.1 uh, of the Convention, meaning quantity and price, and the second. Um, situation is because of the application of Article 3.2 of the Vienna Convention, therefore considering that services are the main part of the obligations within the distributorship agreement. However, I would say that none of these are completely true. To begin with, we have to uh, analyze the contract in itself, of course, because that the will of the parties will determine whether or not the CSG might be applicable to framework agreements. Um, first of all, uh, the lack of quantity and uh, price is not the general rule in all distributorship agreements, and you might find in practice many distributorship uh, agreements where precisely quantity and price are um, already fixed, although determinable in the future, as Article 14 of the CIG precisely provides for the uh, offer. And uh, second, it's not true that services are the main part of the obligations in many uh, distributorship agreements. And therefore, there's the need to uh, analyze the contract, the obligations of the parties within the framework contract in order to see whether or not the uh, contract is governed by, uh, by the convention. Apart from the, um, from the um, area of distributorship contract that are, um, that provides uh, you an insight on, on, on this problematic of the uh, scope of application of the convention. We're seeing also um, a tendency to consider that uh, complex contracts, whether where you find um, several kinds of obligations for, uh, for the parties um, in, in, in the contract, those situations might be well covered also by the CSG. And here, the problematic is with uh, the so-called turnkey contracts, in, in which you find a construction um, or part of part of the construction agreement in a broader sense, but also mm, mm, conceived in a serial of successive um, uh, contracts, in which one of them might be um, one part of this uh, overall turnkey contracts might be well governed by uh, the convention. We've seen in this regard, recent uh, interesting de developments in, in this law. I refer here to an arbitral award of uh, 2019, in which uh, there was a party from Germany and a party from Spain. And uh, here the contract was for the design, manufacture, commission, and the commissioning of industrial, of industrial plant, of an industrial plant. 
Here, the obligations were uh, quite uh, substantive uh, for, for one of the parties. As I said, the design, the manufacturing, the supply, the inspection, the texting, the on-site services as, as well, meaning supervision and training of workers, as well as the erection, installation, pre-commissioning, commissioning and startup up of the equipment within the plant. In that situation, the uh, arbitral award considered that CSG govern the transaction. The parties disagree. One party considered was uh, CSG applicable. The other party thought it was a term key contract, therefore excluded from the application of the convention. But the arbitral, uh, arbitral award considered the application of the CSG uh, to, to this based precisely on the opinion number three. Lastly, and I'm finishing now, um, there is another interesting case uh, coming very recently from the uh, Spanish, uh, Spanish Supreme Court of Spain, also uh, in, a, in a contract where, um, by the way, also a German party and, um, and a Spanish uh, uh, party, uh, party as well, um, whether the, there was the manufacture of the unit, of a unit um, of, um, um, well, a, a, a machine, and assistance for its installation. Uh, also here, the parties disagree on whether or not the CSG applied, but the Supreme Court of Spain considered that the services, meaning the installation, the um, training of the employees and so on, were ancillary to the main obligation of the contract. That was precisely the manufacture and delivery of the goods. This means at the end that it will be, in my opinion, very difficult to find that it, in this kind of mixed contracts, uh, services will be considered to be the main part of the obligations of one of the parties. And therefore, that would be, there would be very rare cases where CSG is uh, um, considered not to be applicable because of this. So therefore, the future lies, in my opinion, future uh, interpretation of the CSG and application, uniform international application lies in this area of the um, so-called standard application of the convention. Thank you very much, Angelo. Um, give, I give you the, the word uh, back. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pilar, for your, for your presentation, which brought us back to the uh, substance of the CISG and not only to the, its important impact on the on domestic uh, legislation. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, thank you, Angelo, particularly for your kind introduction and for the invitation uh, and Thomas for the organization. I am honored as my colleague said and delighted to participate in this special day together with so many dear colleagues and friends. And the only regret expressed also by other speakers is not uh, to see you all in person. So warm greetings to all independently of your time zone. And uh, uh, this is a day of celebration. We heard uh, the 40th birthday of one of the most important uniform law instruments ever adopted, the CSG. And I say this uh, wearing for one moment the hat of uh, the uh, representative of a sister organization, the UNIDRA, and then also as an academic believing in uh, the future of uniform law. Now, uh, undoubtedly uh, today, and also during uh, the, the rest of the course, the previous lectures, students have had the opportunity to become aware of the many reasons for this uh, special recognition. And uh, what I would like to focus on in particular is the model role of CSG for the development of uh, later international instruments. So the preceding uh, speakers, and maybe uh, if we can also hear uh, Alexandra later on, have uh, referred to its influence on national law reforms of contract and obligation law in general. And I will address the influence of CSG on the development of other instruments of uniform law. So the idea is to look at some examples of provisions and practical solutions that were innovative at the time of adoption of the treaty in relation to many domestic laws, and then uh, became a point of reference 
a sort of common core for any subsequent project of harmonization or unifications of sales law and, as we said, more generally, uh, contract law. With one preliminary observation before beginning, like any other major reform, uh, CSG, uh, and this was all, all also already referred to by, by Ingeborg Schwenzer, did not magically appear out of the void as a Minerva fully armed and grown up from the head of Jupiter, and in this case, Ancitral is Jupiter, but it has a history, antecedents, and was itself based on previous models. And not all, but some of these modern common core solutions actually have uh, their roots in this preparatory work, uh, which started back at the beginning of last century with uh, Rabel and the work conducted at UNIDRA on the development of uniform laws on the formation of the contract of sale and the rights and obligations of the parties. But it must be recognized, it must be said that uh, those uh, principles, those rules gained wider recognition and were actually accepted by legislators and applied in practice worldwide because of the CSG. Now, uh, I would like to address uh, two issues if we have time. The first is the model ro role of CSG for the UNIDRA principles of international commercial contracts. And the other is uh, the uh, way CSG has uh, influenced the development of international sales law. So other provisions that have been particularly important for the development of sales law. Now, uh, if we go back to the UNIDRA principles, I do not want to dwell on the obvious differences between the two uh, instruments, two macroscopic ones. Uh, the UNIDRA principles are a soft law codification prepared by a group of international experts endorsed by UNIDRA, so they are not meant to become part of national law legislator, legislation. Um, even if it did happen uh, that legal systems uh, use them as a model for contract law reform, they are basically a tool in the hands of contract parties and adjudicators. So they are not a treaty like CSG hard law. And the second macroscopic difference is that CSG covers commercial sales contract while the UNIDRA principles apply to all types of commercial contract and they apply to a wider range of issues related to contract law and obligations. But this is understandable because CSG is a treaty and as such, it necessarily had from the start a more limited and specific scope of application, therefore express ex exclusions, implied exclusions, gaps, but we have also heard that a lot has been done in interpreting and in filling in these gaps uh, in CSG through uh, case law and through scholarly interpretation. There are provisions that refer to domestic law for certain issues or that were left internationally intentionally vague or incomplete. But undoubtedly, when we look at the substantive provision, CSG was the first point of reference and model for the UNIDRA principles. And a number of provisions are literally the same, or at least they are based on the same fundamental solutions. So I'll go through uh, some of them starting with one provision which uh, does not deal directly with substantive contract law issues, but it's uh, in, in, in the, one of the most important provisions, the interpretation of the instrument itself. Uh, this model went on from CSG to become a standard used in other treaties and in other soft law codifications with the same basic idea, first of all, of the need of an autonomous interpretation that fosters uniformity in the application of the instrument. And secondly, as far as possible for matters governed by the instrument, which are not expressly settled, to look first to the underlying principles of the instrument uh, itself. Now, on this topic, there is a wealth of literature discussion but 
what I would like to underline is that this standard was taken over by the principles. Uh, and so it's Article 7, first paragraph and second paragraph of the CSG in the interpretation of this convention, regard is to be had to its international character, to the need to promote uniformity uh, and the observance of good faith in international trade. And the second paragraph, which deals with the supplementation uh, uh, referring to the underlying general principles of CSG and in the absence of such principles in conformity with the applicable law. So if we look at uh, Article 1.6 uh, of the UNIDRA principles, we find a very similar language in the first paragraph. Uh, and there is no reference to the good faith uh, um, in international trade. Uh, but uh, this is uh, uh, justified by the fact that the UNIDRA principles contain an express general principle on good faith in Article 1.6, which is uh, interpreted as a general principle of the um, uh, UNIDRA principles themselves. Now, uh, also the second uh, issue, the issue of the uh, supplementation and integration of the instrument follows the same basic approach adapted to the fact that the UNIDRA principles are not a treaty and therefore there is no reference uh, to uh, domestic law as a closing um, uh, reference. Parties can choose, however, if they wish to, a specific domestic law as suggested in the model clauses for the application of the UNIDRA uh, principles. Now, another common feature is the importance of usages. Uh, in the hierarchy of sources to determine the content of a contract and also to interpret it. And here we have Article 9 of the CSG. Uh, the parties are bound by any usage to which they have agreed or by any practices uh, which they have established between themselves. And this is exactly the same wording as in Article 1.9 of the UNIDRA principles. Then we have the second paragraph referring to international usages, usages uh, widely known to and regularly observed by parties to contracts in international trade. And here again, the UNIDRA principles have, have followed the same fundamental uh, idea uh, with the addition of an exception, the exception where the application of such a usage would be unreasonable, but this is uh, 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 something that can be certainly interpreted uh, when one looks at CSG. Now, there are basic rules on formation on co of contract, and this is really one of the backbones of the common core of rules developed by CSG, partly coming from previous instruments based on comparative studies focusing on a functional approach. And the other important point here is also the creation of a basic terminology, which is one of the most important legacies of CSG, a terminology that is used then later on in other uh, uh, it, not, not only national uh, law uh, systems, but probably much more in uh, harmonized and uniform instruments, uh, even at European level. Now, uh, what do we find here, which is common as between uh, CSG and the UNIDRA principles, uh, the reference to the offer and the acceptance, uh, the distinction between withdrawal of an offer and revocation, uh, of the offer itself. Now the rules on revocation are really uh, very similar, Articles uh, 16 and Article 214 of the UNIDRA principles. Uh, an offer can be revoked even after it has reached the offeree, but only up to a certain time before the offeree has dispatched an acceptance and under certain conditions, there are situations where an offer is considered to be irrevocable. Now, this is a, an area where there is very scarce case law, but it's still quite an interesting and important common core uh, provision. Uh, rules on acceptance uh, are uh, 
taken uh, uh, almost literally, literally uh, from the CSG by the UNIDWA principles uh, with uh, some displacement in, in the different articles. Uh, but maybe one of the most interesting um, provisions uh, contained in CSG and also taken over by the UNIDWA principles is the uh, Article 19 on the modified acceptance. Uh, this is the situation when the acceptance is different from the offer and legal systems, as, as you uh, know, have different solutions. Not all take into account the reality of commercial contracts and parties' expectations, uh, while Article 19 uh, starts with the uh, general uh, principle that are applied to an offer which contains additions, limitations, or other modifications is a rejection of the offer, constitutes a counter offer. There is a limitation if this, uh, these modifications do not materially alter the terms of the offer. This is an acceptance. The contract is concluded at the new ter terms unless the offeror, without undue delay, objects. And the provision in the Literally the same, except for the list of issues that are deemed to be material in CSG and are not uh, included in the UNIDRA principles provision. And the UNIDRA principles have further extended this uh, uh, to apply to the so called writings in confirmation, uh, a writing which is usually sent after the conclusion of the contract and which purports to be a confirmation of the contract. If there is a, a purported change in, uh, in, in the content um, uh, as relates uh, the contract which had already been concluded, then the same uh, provision, uh, the same uh, basic rule will apply. Now, uh, let me turn uh, to uh, another uh, section of CSG, uh, the section on uh, remedies. Here again, we have one of the most important uh, provisions uh, relating to uh, avoidance in the language of CSG, termination for non-performance, uh, uh, and it's the uh, provision on the fundamental breach as a basis for avoidance, Ar Article 25. A breach of contract committed by one of the parties is fundamental if it results in such detriment to the other party as substantially to deprive that party of what it is entitled to expect under the contract unless there was a, a, no uh, possibility to foresee on the part of the part in breach uh, which, uh, and, and this is an objective uh, test. Now, uh, Article 731 uh, of the UNIDWA principles uh, follows the same approach, uh, and uh, the fundamental uh, um, non performance uh, becomes uh, the uh, reason why it is possible to uh, ask for a, a termination of the contract. So, what is the difference? Uh, there's two elements. Uh, the first is that the uh, provision of the UNIDRA principles contains a list of elements that should be particularly considered by the interpreter in deciding whether there is a fundamental uh, non-performance. The second is the terminology. The UNIDRA principles decided not to use the word breach, but the underlying principle is the same termination as a last resort for commercial contracts. And this uh, the underlying principle has had an enormous influence through CSG on national law reforms, on the interpretation of national law, even if the law had not uh, been changed, like for example, uh, in Spain or in Italy, or other soft law uh, codifications. Uh, again, if we continue with uh, uh, termination or avoidance in the language of CSG, uh, we have another common uh, provision. Uh, a declaration of avoidance of the contract is effective, effective only if made by notice to the other party. So the idea that there is no automatic uh, termination, no, uh, but 
you, you need to have a notice to the other party. This is taken over by the UNIDRA principles in Article 732, first paragraph. Now, we can find uh, other uh, common core rules uh, in the section on damages. Uh, many of the provisions that are contained in CSG are actually uh, also contained in the UNIDRA principles who add uh, other uh, solutions and other situations. But I would like to mention in particular the foreseeability test in Article 74 CSG, the damages may not exceed the loss which the party in breach foresaw or ought to have foreseen at the time of conclusion of the contract. This is the same foreseeability test is present also in the UNIDRA principles in Article 744. Uh, and it has been used also in uh, uh, the uh, development of other uh, soft law codifications, uh, in particular, for example, within uh, uh, Europe, European uh, academic groups. Now, uh, I'm moving towards the conclusion because I would like to go uh, to pass to the issues that are most closely connected to a sales contract, a situation where CSG has uh, uh, influenced the development of international sales uh, in particular. And the first point I would like to address is the issue of the passing of risk. So the situation of the passing of risk is well known. There is a risk that the goods perish before they reach the, um, the buyer, particularly when a contract of sale involves carriage of the goods. And in many traditional legal systems, the risk is linked, passes with the transfer of ownership, which is of course something very difficult to ascertain. And it might be a different point in time depending on the applicable law. So what CSG introduces is the passing of risk disjointed from the issue of ownership and connected mostly to the idea of the delivery. Now, strictly speaking, this is not a, a new solution. It is contained, for example, it was already contained in uh, clauses uh, uh, developed by the uh, International Chamber of Commerce, the Incoterms, uh, but CSG introduced, uh, this, uh, introduced these rules on the passing of risk uh, as modern default rules uh, for uh, international commercial sales. And uh, art Article 67, uh, just as an example, uh, uh, if the contract of sale involves carriage of the goods and the seller is not bound to hand them over at a particular place, the risk passes to the buyer when the goods are handed over to the first carrier. So you see the importance of the delivery and not of any kind of title on the goods uh, on the buyer or on the seller. A final central issue that I would like to mention is the non-conforming delivery by the buyer. Here, CSG introduces a number of uh, extremely important concepts that are, have then uh, in, been uh, particularly influential uh, for the development of uh, uh, sales law in general and international sales law in particular a unified concept of non-conformity as opposed to differentiating remedies depending on the type of non-conformity, defects which are hidden, are not hidden, or whether the buyer delivered goods that were substantially different from the ones envisaged in the contract, whether the buyer delivered a different quantity or did not package the goods in the agreed manner or in the manner usual for such goods or adequate to preserve and protect the goods. So all this is under a unified concept of non-conformity with the same remedies and with the same requirements in order to be able to exercise the remedies, which is the requirement of examination and notice on the part of the buyer. This again has become a 
a point of reference for the development of uh, international uh, and generally sales law. So uh, in conclusion, I would like to come back to the cause of this celebration, the 40th anniversary of CSG. Uh, as we heard from the preceding uh, lectures, uh, uh, CSG is very much alive. It's uh, uh, very much uh, still developing. And I would like to express the wish that the 100th, why not, ratification of CSG may come before the 100th anniversary of UNIDRA. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anna, for this uh, very interesting uh, comparison between the CISG and the UNIDRA principles, but also for looking beyond to the influence of the CISG on, on the development of, of sales law more generally. So I have the privilege to, to uh, close this cycle of speeches on the CISG. And all I could do it to invite you to look at it from a slightly different angle. And it is the CISG, and I call it CISG as the backbone of transnational commercial law. And uh, what I'd like to do here is to present to you the relationship between the CISG and other sources of what we know as transnational commercial law. Just very briefly, as we We've heard today the CISG is not something that started from scratch in Vienna in the 1970s. It was built on, on a solid rock of a long preparatory work that was done at UNIDRA even before World War II and then was eventually uh, accomplished in the diplomatic conference in The Hague in 1964 with two conventions which entered to force, but mainly in continental Europe. And then that work was, the, those two conventions then were then taken over by the United Nations with the hope that it would be able to be converted in an instrument that would gain universal acceptance. And as we know, that uh, effort has been a successful one, which is proven by the number of ratification of the CISG uh, so far with the adoption of the Convention 1980. But the practical importance of this CISG is not only that the figure of 94 countries, which is very significant, it being, as, uh, as we all know, only second to the New York Convention on uh, uh, Recognition and Enforcement of Foreign Arbitral Awards, and also not only because the countries that have ratified this CISG represent about two-thirds of the world uh, trade in, in goods, but also because they represent various legal traditions and the fact that countries from so many different traditions in the world are able to ratify and implement the CISG is an uh, eloquent proof that the solutions found in the CISG work well in different uh, legal systems. Now, um, it does so by providing them the full truth for the most important elements of uh, an international sale contract, as you know, beginning with uh, the, the, the formation of contract, interpretation of contracts, the obligation of the seller, the obligation of the buyers, remedies from each part in case of breach by the other party, damages, avoidance, etc. And you've do, done so, as you heard today, in a manner that reconciles different uh, legal traditions, but also bears in, bears, in, bears in mind the fundamental interest of promoting uh, stability of trade relations, forcibility and previsibility in uh, international commercial contracts. Now, why do we, can we call also the CISG as a backbone of transnational commercial law? Because the CISG also recognizes the value of, of uh, customs and usages in trade, which I've just heard that in the presentation by uh, Professor uh, Veneziano, but also incorporates and allows the parties to incorporate into their transactions other sources of obligations derived from uh, custom and practice, but also developed by uh, private international organizations. And then it is the backbone because as we also heard today, it has been an extremely influential in a domestic law reform of contract law. But that's just, just in, very briefly uh, clarify what we mean by transnational commercial law. In a world that is not uh, ruled by a world government. The law develops on the basis of agreements that countries uh, uh, develop voluntarily uh, 
but also these agreements in form of conventions don't cover every single subject of the law. It's so that we are dealing here with a web of different sources of rules or standards that would then be used in practice by private business, by companies, and by lawyers. And this web of rules, and I'm here presenting a definition by uh, professors uh, Good and Kronk, Kronk and McKendrick and Wood in uh, their uh, uh, book, Transnational Commercial Law, is the law that governs international commercial transactions and that be then from whatever source they are and as distinct, however, from the law that governs uh, the public international law aspects of trade, that is, the, for instance, the rules of the World Trade Organization. Now, this variety of different sources is here compiled in a list that uh, was uh, put together by uh, Professor Olo Lando in a very famous uh, article, The Lex Mercatoria International Commercial Arbitration, and you see the diversity of the rules of law that make up what we know as transnational commercial law. Maybe public international law, for instance, the CISG is an instrument of public international law. Maybe under uniform laws, though those, the, uh, the two 1964 conventions in The Hague contained a uniform law as an annex, and as other uniform laws are also known in, in the world. General principles of law, we heard the reference to the unit law principles as a compilation of general principles of law, but also rules developed by international organizations, uncodified custom and usages, or codification of custom and usages done by uh, private parties, or strand, stand, standard contract forms. All this, and, and even arbitral awards, all these are sources of these norms that will have necessarily a different binding force and a different hierarchy in different uh, legal systems. All this is what we uh, call the work of harmonization of private law and is driven by these two forces, intergovernmental legal harmonization and non-governmental legal harmonization. The intergovernmental legal harmonization uh, which is uh, done at the uh, global level by institutions such as UNCITRAL, but also the Hague Conference of Private International Law, or UNIDRA, and at the regional, le regional level by the EU, but also by other uh, entities such as Asia, NAFTA, or Mer Mercosur, is one that uh, uses those mechanisms that public international law puts at the disposal of the community of states, and that is mainly Primary one is the treaty in the form of international conventions, but also maybe other instruments such as model law and others that carry with them the, so to speak, the imprimatur of one po international political organization that recommends them for use by governments. And then at the non-governmental side, we have entities of the private sector, such as the International Chamber of Commerce, the Comité Maritime International, and other entities. We'll see a few examples of the instruments they produce, but also academic institutions, such as the Lando Commission, at a certain point in Europe in the development of European contract law, or the American Law Institute for promoting the harmonization of the law uh, in, uh, within the United States, uh, as you know, uh, each in, uh, unit of the United States has legislative power over private law matters, and the harmonization of law is uh, promoted by uh, inter alia by a private institution such as the American Law Institute. Private law harmonization, of course, cannot use the treaty because this is a privilege of states. They use other mechanisms, principles, restatements of law, or uh, standard contracts. Why is it that governments harmonize uh, international uh, uh, commercial law? They do it because they believe that legal difference can create trade barriers because they increase transaction costs and may discourage smaller or medium enterprises from tr uh, trying to tap to bigger markets because they cannot buy uh, or cannot secure legal advice in, in all these different jurisdictions. Legal differences can increase the cost of litigation and, th and there, there, thereby 
uh, also increase the, the cost of transactions or the uh, dispute settlement become more complex. And finally, an argument that's spe especially appealing to smaller countries that have to compete for foreign direct investment that uh, har harmonizing the domestic legal system with the national standards makes the country more attractive for attracting international investment. Well, this work of international uh, harmonization through governments is one that has covered a wide uh, variety of areas of the law. I would give you first only examples of the main areas, showing also the different mechanisms that have been used for that purpose. And one here in the area of sales of law, we have the basic instrument being the CISG, but also the unit draw principles, more broadly not on sales only, but also general contract laws, two instruments that are of a very different nature, the CISG being a treaty, the principles being a good example of uh, soft law. Then you go move to another era, the era of carriage of goods, and here there has been extensive legal harmonization through hard law, through international conventions, for the various modes of transportation. Here we have the, you see the list of the instruments that govern the international carriage of goods by sea. This is a very fragmented uh, area with the bulk of states still being parties to the old system developed in the 1920s, the, uh, the so-called Hague-Visby rules. Uh, a more recent UN convention, the Hamburg rules, have been uh, adopted by 34 states, and the most recent one, the Rotterdam rules, which uh, uh, has not gained into force with only four ratifications so far, but also have uh, harmonization of the carriage of goods by air, by rail, and by road, each of them by a separate international con convention. So this is an era that is highly uh, harmonized uh, through uh, international treaties. Then another area where we have an extensive work of harmonization is the area of international commercial arbitration, beginning with the 1958 uh, New York Convention, but that's so then followed with by the Ancetral Arbitration Rules, which are a completely different instrument. They are meant for use by uh, arbitrators and tribunals, but the Ancetral Model Law and International Commercial Arbitration, that is a model recommended by the United Nations for use by states, and the Model Law on Commercial Mediation, which has now been enacted by 33 states, also uh, uh, an instrument that is not as binding as a convention, but it has a more a stronger legislative appeal than uh, a simple restatement. Now, why is it the private sector also is engaged in legal harmonization? The private sector is engaged in legal harmonization for uh, reasons that are similar but not necessarily identical with those whereby uh, governments engage in this process. The private sector has long supported harmonization because the private sector is persuaded that, that standardization increases trade efficiently, efficiency because standard uh, terms of, and risk allocation patterns offer reliable parameters for price setting. If you know exactly what is the consequences of breach by contract by one or the other party, they, the parties can make insurance arrangements and other arrangements to better allocate those risks. Standardization also reduces transaction costs rather than having to renegotiate a force majeure clause or a damages clause, you simply take a standard one and you include that in your contract and that makes uh, contract uh, conclusion more efficient. And also standardization enhances predictability. The outcome of disputes uh, is more easier, is easier to, uh, to predict if the contract already uses uh, terms that are standard, that are familiar to the parties, that may be familiar to arbitrators, and you reduce the risk of your re, uh, contractual allocation of the rights and responsibilities being upset by a law that uh, may be unknown to you, but is found by the competent court to be the applicable law to that particular case. Now the standard, the private sector has done this work of legal harmonization, as I mentioned to you extensively, through using different uh, mechanisms and different instruments. Here an example of rules, a list of rules that have been used by various organizations. The, uh, to begin with, with the ICC, um, the uh, Incoterms, they're not strictly speaking rules as they're more in the form of a glossary of terms. 
but also the uniform customs and practice for documentary credits, UCP 600, that is basically incorporated in more than 90% of every single letter of credit you see in circulation in international trade is subject to these rules by voluntary choice of the parties. And these rules are the rules developed by a private entity, the International Chamber of Commerce. The same also applies for demand guarantees. But the ICC is not the only one in the business of developing rules that are used by, widely by the private sector. All the uh, international wide transfer transactions in the world are subject to the SWIFT general terms and conditions, the SWIFT being the society of, uh, that congregates the banking sector in the world to organize why transfers, uh, transfers of uh, funds internationally between banks and, and also allocate their uh, duties and responsibilities. But also the Comité Maritime International, an ancient organization that congregates the interests of the private sector related to shipping, has uh, uh, developed various rules that are incorporated into, into uh, standard contracts. If you look at any standard bill of lading, if you look at the back, there would be a reference to this particular instrument, the York Antwerp Rules on General Average, you know that General Average being that institute whereby uh, the cargo owners and the ship owners share the loss in case you, the, of, uh, the, uh, the ship sinks or you have to sacrifice uh, goods in the ship in order to, to, to rescue the ship from, from a peril of the sea. And the uh, rules that govern this, this sharing of, of losses is, are the New York, the York Antwerp rules developed by the CMI. But also model contracts. The ICC also has developed a model international uh, sales contract on which also the CISG has been influential. But contracts that are specific to specific industries. The uh, Grain and Feed Trade Association or the Federation of Oil, Seeds and Fats they develop their own standard contracts that are widely used in those particular sectors. Basically, if you buy grain in any grain exchange, commodity exchange around the world, in most cases, it will be subject to one of these standard contracts. So all this also by voluntary choice of the parties. Also, in the uh, financial markets, the International Swaps and Derivative Association has also a master agreement concerning uh, the uh, their mutual obligations in case of, uh, for instance, of insolvency and shortage of securities by one or the other part and how they will net their uh, mutual positions. In the maritime sector as well, but also in the construction sector, we have a series of standard model contracts that are, that are widely used in practice, be it the, uh, the model, the standard bills of lading developed by the Baltic and International Maritime Council, BINCOM, but also uh, conditions of contract for construction, plan and design built, or for turnkey uh, projects, we heard that and also heard the relationship between uh, this type of contracts and the CISG. Now, as I come close to my conclusion, and then we bring us then close back to the CISG, and why we, call the, we may call, uh, rightfully call the CISG as a backbone of, uh, of transnational commercial law. First of all, because the sales contract stands in the middle of a web of contracts that are necessary to perform an international sales transaction. The sales contract doesn't stand alone. The sales contract has to be accompanied by the transport and warehousing contract to ensure the, the, the delivery of the goods to the buyer. It has to be accompanied by another contract that ensures the payment from the, the uh, buyer to the seller, and there will be yet another contract to, uh, to, ensure, to ensure the goods against the risk of loss or damage during transit. And each of these uh, situations, there will be the variations that will, where one or the other instrument of this web of transnational commercial law may, may be more or less relevant. For sales contract, for instance, for manufacturer goods, we will, do, we will not have as wide a use of uh, model contracts as we have, for instance, for commodities and futures. And here you are more likely also to, then, to be, have contracts that will be falling naturally under this CISG. For transport and warehousing, depending on the type of carriage, you would have a carriage that is heavily regulated by uh, a mandatory law in the form of international conventions, 
to another extreme where we come to the so-called uh, tramp uh, trade where commodities are, are carried by uh, in a ship that is uh, chartered by, by one of the parties and typically a charter part is not subject to any convention. No mandatory law is a realm of uh, party autonomy and freedom of contract. And if you look then at the, the uh, credit contract, the documentary credit, again, you may look in vain for an international treaty or convention governing the terms of documentary credits. It is all done by private sector self-regulation through the UCP 600 and its voluntary use by the banking sector. Different story if the price is paid by credit transfers. There you may have legislation which is more, uh, more or less mandatory in many countries. There is, for instance, a EU directory, the directive on credit transfers within the EU, uh, uh, but there is nothing similar to that for uh, documentary credits. Insurance is, again, an, an area where you may have extensive legislation to protect, to protect perhaps the weaker party to the contract, but there is not a single mandatory instrument at the global level governing insurance contracts. It's all basically the result of self-regulation by the private sector and market practice and uh, freedom of contract. We heard already then, we heard already the reference in uh, previous presentations today of particular provisions in the CISG that defer to usages. And the, apart from this general provision in Article 9 that says that the parties are considered unless otherwise agreed to have impliedly made applicable to their contract any usage which they knew or ought to have known, and this is a very clear recognition by the CISG and is an interesting recognition by a treaty that uh, private uh, practice, uh, party rules or standards may become applicable because they are part of the dealings of the party or the parties of our because they should have known that they exist. But this is not only the case, in, uh, not, the, not the only instance in the CISG where there is this implicit reference to, um, to private sector uh, standards. We also have that, we heard, uh, of Article 67, we have that also in Article uh, 58 uh, uh, concerning the point of the of delivery of the goods, and here again there is a clear link between the regulation of delivery within the CISG and the carriage terms that the parties would have agreed because each carrier carried terms depending on whether we are choosing an FOB term or are choosing a CIF term, you are choosing an X works clause or uh, a delivery duty pay clause, you may be pushing the moment of delivery to one or the other end, and the CISG is cognizant of the commercial considerations that the parties may have for choosing one or the other term and defers to them to, uh, uh, to uh, regulate that in the contract as they see fit. Also, the, that is also clearly uh, reflected in Article uh, 67, but also here the uh, reference um, in uh, these provisions of the CISG also to the notion of assuming control of the goods by delivery of documents. And the CISG itself says nothing about which documents are these that, uh, that uh, secure, that uh, guarantee control of the goods. And this is to a very large extent the result of international development of practice and there is even in the conventions concerning carriage precious little reference to the relationship between the transport document and possession of the goods. It's, ba it's basically an evolution of practice that in many countries is legislated but is not the object of international direct uh, uh, harmonization. I would like to conclude my 15 minutes and before we then have a chance to, for, for discussion also concerning the, uh, the uh, previous presentations to recapitulate this aspect of the CISG as a backbone of uh, transnational commercial law. Uh, by offering default rules, the CISG helps parties to an international sales contract reduce transaction, transaction costs. There's many things that they don't have to worry about. If something uh, wrong happens, there is a mechanism that will apply. 
but whenever they found a different solution from the CISG, that different solution will be automatically upheld by the courts. Um, this recognition of uh, trade customs and use usages also uh, takes into account that uh, the parties may prefer to abide by uh, a, a, a custom that they are familiar with, but also in some situations they would be held to, to, to abide by that because that is, that is the expectation of the other party to the contract. And the third point that I, I think is important to bear in mind is that the CISG can be also combined with soft law instruments where, where the parties wish to clarify in advance the matters that are not expressly covered by the CISG or also whenever they want to deviate from the CISG. For instance, the moment of delivery, the passage of risk, the responsibility for the cost of insurance, the responsibility for the cost of the freight, all that the parties don't need then to negotiate in, the, in their contract. They can simply choose one of the INCO terms and that would work perfectly well with the CISG. Or the right that the uh, seller has to deliver the documents that give control of the goods to the buyer only upon payment by the buyer, that accommodates the structure of a typically documentary credit transactions whereby the buyer would ask a bank to open the letter of credit to the benefit of the seller and uh, the seller would uh, receive payment once it then, it then uh, makes proof to the bank of the shipment of, of the goods. So that by uh, these provisions, the CISG opens, so to speak, this window to the parties to use these uh, various uh, instruments of private sector regulation. And then the last uh, aspect of the CISG that makes it the, the a backbone of transactional commercial law is the influence it has had on this tacit harmonization of law. It is a very interesting development to see a treaty that beyond its own mandatory application becomes the source of inspiration for countries to modernize their own domestic law. And we heard example, the example today of the, uh, the recently adopted Civil Code of China. We would have heard from, uh, from uh, Professor Komarov also the influence of the CISG in the drafting of the Civil Code of the Russian Federation, but it's not, only, it's not only countries in transition or countries that uh, are moving from a planned economy to a market economy, even uh, other uh, countries with well anchored in the Western uh, market economy system, such as Germany, when it reformed its law of obligations, looked at the CISG uh, for many of the solutions to, uh, to modernize the law of obligations. The same thing recently when France adopted its new uh, law of obligation, for instance, introduced the notion of termination by notice rather than necessarily termination of contract only by judicial order. So with that, that makes the CISG a unique instrument in that, that sense. It, is, it accommodates custom, it accommodates private autonomy, it influences legislation beyond its own uh, its own uh, mandatory scope of application and allows the party to use the soft law instruments to supplement its provisions. This also uh, can also be done in cases where the unit draw principles, for example, to offer a solution that the parties find, find to be more detailed than the CISG and to be supplementary to, uh, to the CISG in that particular situation. I would like to conclude that also by uh, uh, stressing the amount of information that already exists on the CISG, not only here as you see here in the slide, the information that has been compiled and developed by, by the Secretary of UNCITRA as the Secretary of the body that developed uh, the CISG, but also by the work of uh, great scholars and legal minds such as those who have joined us today, who have written commentaries on the CISG, who sit on the CISG advisory panel, or also who, through their activity as arbitrators, by using the CISG, help further to uh, develop this body of uh, uh, uniform uh, sales law, which is a part, the central part, 
uh, of this wider body of uh, transnational commercial law being the set of rules that uh, are uh, governing international trade, partly be, be for mandatory application, but to a very large extent because of their persuasive value and their voluntary adoption by uh, the private sector. So with that, I would like to conclude these remarks. We have a few minutes left for questions. I don't know whether any, there would be any question in the room that I uh, would like to ask. Yes, I see three. Let's begin with the back with the first. Um, the question is whether the enforceability of a particular custom uh, as between uh, two parties uh, under 9.1 could be enforceable as against other uh, parties to a different trade transaction on the basis of 9.2 and of a similar nature, yes, of a contract of a sim similar nature on the basis of 9.2 and the answer would be no, for the following reason. Uh, the enforceable custom and usage under 9.2 is one of, so to speak, universal application, at least in that particular trade. 9.1 concerns practices and user usages that two parties have established between themselves and are specific to one particular transaction. Now, uh, if what these two parties are doing under 9.1 is done sufficiently long and by a sufficiently number, large number of people, eventually that might become a usage that is enforceable in that particular trade under 9.2. But 9.1 and 9.2 deal with two, uh, two different uh, situations. So the question is, we, we acknowledge that CISG was drafted to, uh, to bring together, uh, to bridge gaps between uh, different legal systems and has been influential also uh, in, in the harmonization of law on whether, but whether the CISG would have had uh, solutions that were un completely unknown before and didn't exist before. Um, that is not as uh, such, necessary. we do not find too many examples of an entirely new uh, solution to CISG, partly because uh, part of the, uh, to a large extent, the, with the existing CISG was already there in the uh, 1964 uh, Hague Conventions, but not everything in the CISG is simply a compromise uh, between two systems. Uh, in some cases, the CISG chooses one system above the other and uh, expresses a preference for one solution rather than uh, for the other. I mean, the example, termination by notice, right? Termination by notice is not necessarily a compromise. It's something that uh, many legal uh, jurisdictions from the civil law world simply uh, didn't uh, recognize before. And the CISG draft has considered that that would be a better solution for international trade than uh, obliging the, the parties to, to resort to court. Uh, fundamental breach, for example, is another, is, is another example of a solution where the CISG draft has found that the limitation, the right to terminate the contract under common law was made more sense in the context of an international negotiation than the possibility of simply uh, terminating a contract no matter how important the breach by the other party was. Uh, 
but uh, of, of say a, a radically new solution completely invented by the drafters of the CSG, that is not something that we will find necessarily. Also because you don't, uh, the work of legal harmonization is a work mainly of prudence and you like to use more tested, uh, tested solutions rather than ones that are completely, I mean, invented just out of the blue. Yes. I think I had one more here in the front and then you, yes, please. Uh, so the question is, why was the CISG more successful than the two Hague Conventions? Just a matter of the number of the participation of more countries or there is anything related to the substance of the CISG? And the answer is both. The answer is both and to the extent that the participation, obviously because uh, the Hague Conventions coming out of the work of Rune Dra, they, they began in the 1920s among European countries. Right? They are carried on by UNIDRA after World War II uh, before the big peak of the decolonization movement in the 1960s. So by the time uh, they were adopted, they had been developed by a world that was not the world on the streets because you had already a number of countries that had become independent that had not participated in that work. But also significantly, the United States had not been heavily involved in in that work before because it was not a member of UNIDRA at that point in time. So these are the formal political reasons why it was considered that uh, the participation on this ISG was not that universal. Uh, as for the uh, content, there are uh, examples, you can find examples on the CISG where actually the CISG has improved on rules uh, found in the in the uh, the Hague, uh, the Hague, the two Hague conventions. For example, the uh, Hague conventions treat delivery as so as a, as a, as a legal institute. It says the seller has to effect delivery, and attached to that a certain number of uh, uh, consequences. A delivery is only a delivery if the goods conform, if it's made in time, et cetera, et cetera. And that structure is considered by many to be very doctrinal and abstract. And when the, uh, this was taken over at the, uh, at the UNCTRAL to negotiate this ISG, it was decided that rather to use an abstract contact like this, it was more practical to transform that, to analyze it step by step and say, what does it mean the seller has to do or has to deliver goods that conform to contract, has to deliver goods that are free of third party interest, has to deliver goods in time, etc. So to, to make that a more uh, analytical and descriptive rather than having a, a something that is regarded as being, as being uh, too doctrinal. Just to give one example, there are other examples as well. So it's a combination of the two factors. There was less political participation, but also some uh, central elements of the CISG which are found not to be particularly appealing to other uh, legal systems. In this case, in particular, was the United States that opposed, that was contrary to this structure and the, and the Hague uh, conventions. Yes, please. Okay, so the question is, how can the CISG, which is concerned with the one particular contract, be influential on in the legislation that modernizes contract law more broadly? And the answer is, uh, yes, it can. Obviously, not every single provision can be extrapolated. For example, a provision on uh, the time of delivery or uh, 
obligation to deliver goods that are free of intellectual property by a third party, that's very specific to a sales contract, right? Or the obligation, the provision that, that says delivery is affected the moment you deliver the goods to the first carrier. Again, that's very specific to the sales contract. But for instance, uh, what you heard from uh, Professor Veneziano, this notion, the unitary notion of breach, the, the, this single definition, a breach of contract is simply your failure to perform anything according to the contract is a breach of contract. Rather than having, following the old Roman law, the specific remedies, if you deliver something different from what you promised, then the remedy is A. If you deliver something of a lesser quality, then the remedy is B. Now, that notion of the unitary notion of breach, this has been incorporated by, by for instance, in the, the, the reform of the German law of obligations, and it was cited, if you, you read the, the explanations in, in before the German parliament, was cited, this, as you are cited, it was an example of how this is possible and was compatible with the tradition of civil law. Uh, the notion of fundamental breach, again, is another uh, uh, notion that is not specific to the, to the sales contract. You can extrapolate to others. The, the notion of uh, termination by notice rather than only termination through, uh, judicial, uh, through uh, judicial order. So, and the entire part of formation, because the fact is that the, all the rules and formation of contract under the CISG can very well be used for most commercial contracts, not only sales contracts. So that entire part is one that is of a broader relevance than only sales. One more question? So why, is, uh, why do countries refrain from ratifying the CSG, for instance, India, that could possibly benefit from participating in this system? There may be many reasons for that. And let me begin perhaps with the less important reasons, but as a reason in practice. Sometimes it's inertia. Uh, no, you will not find anyone in Portugal that will tell you how, why is it that it took Portugal 40 years to ratify this ISG. Maybe there is this, this notion of let's see what others will do before I move and before that, you know, uh, because changing the law, you have to take this treaty, translate it, you have to draft legislation, you have to send it to parliament. It's not something that you do every day and parliament would have different priorities. So people in the uh, structures, ministerial structures would think twice before sending a big treaty for ratification to their parliament. That's one argument, it's purely political bureaucratic. The other argument is, for instance, the argument of that uh, many in the city of London would use against ratification of the CISG by United Kingdom, say we think that our says law is superior to the CISG, why should we ratify this treaty? It's written a strange way, it's not the way you write a treaty, we can draft something better, and our precedents are, are much better for says contract. We don't need it, and we don't think it would be in our interest, and actually our interests are best uh, promoted by promoting the choice of English law as governing law to treat, to uh, contracts. And this is an argument that is very strong in England. If you go to Edinburgh or here in Scotland, a completely different argument. And I say that actually they should have ratified, but uh, you know, Scotland cannot ratify the CISG separately from the United Kingdom. Uh, and that argument, I mean, this attachment to, of England to its English law, and I'm saying that very neutral, I'm not passing judgment on the quality of English law, is one uh, argument that is influential in some of the uh, uh, previous dominions of the United Kingdom, including India, where you know, then we have then this debate among, among uh, lawyers, should we depart from the law that we know, that we have known for, for such a long time, being English law, should we do something new? 
I can only tell you that the fact that there's something new is entirely compatible with the common law, and the proof is that you have big common law jurisdictions that have ratified the CISG, and that was not a, a problem. So it's a combination of uh, certain uh, factors. The only countries from which you hear as a group of countries that they have a problem with the CISG, and you heard that reference already in uh, Professor Schwenzer's presentation, are the uh, countries that follow the Islamic Sharia, that uh, are uh, unhappy with troop two provisions of the CISG that some uh, of Sharia scholars claim to be inconsistent with Sharia. One is the recognition of the duty to pay interest in the provision, in provisions uh, and damages on the CISG. And the second is the uh, recognition of the rights to uh, uh, compensation of loss of profit under the damages in the CISG. The, uh, there is some school of thought among uh, Islamic lawyers that say these two things are completely incompatible with the Sharia because the Sharia prohibits speculation and prohibits usury. And it's considered that loss of profit is, uh, is a speculative notion and interest is usury and that kind of remuneration of money is incompatible with the, with the with Islamic Sharia. Other countries of the Arabic world have ratified this CISG, such as Iraq and, and Egypt. Admittedly, they are less influenced by the Sharia, but they found that that, that compensatory interest is not remuneratory is not as a remuneration, but as a compensation, was not contrary to their traditions. That's the only group of countries from which you hear that they have a, a, an issue of substance with the uh, CISG, and apart from uh, the English uh, legal community that says our law is superior, we don't need this. Okay? Now with that then, Thank you for your attention today, and I think you also will join me also again in also thanking all the, the previous speakers for their presentation. Thank you.